Hello and welcome to the Dublin City Development Plan pre-draft public consultation. My name is Sinead O'Donnell and I'll be your host for today's event. And I want to begin by thanking you all for taking the time to be here today. These are unprecedented and extremely challenging times. And I know that Dublin City Council very much appreciates your participation in this process, particularly at this time. This is your city. And Dublin City Council wants everyone, youth groups, older citizens, businesses, community organisations and local residents to have your say on the city's future. This is the first stage in preparing the new Dublin City Development Plan for 2022 to 2028. And as part of this first stage, a strategic issues paper has been prepared providing an overview of the key themes and some of the issues and challenges that are likely to be considered in the new plan, such as transport, housing, culture, climate action and retail. Now, this webinar is focused on the theme movement and transport. And the purpose of this webinar is to provide you with an overview of this key theme, to hear more about it, to ask questions and to gather more details before you make your submission and have your say. And there may be some of you here today who have maybe perhaps already read the strategic issues paper on the website and maybe even have submitted your views, while others may be participating in this process for the very first time. Regardless of your experience, Dublin City Council's hope is that each and every one of you will log on to the website www.dublincitydevelopmentplan.ie and share your views. You'll see displayed here on the screen the strategic issues paper that you can read on the website. And to share your views, simply click make a submission seen here at the bottom of the screen. A submission does not need to be a long report. It can simply be your ideas of how the city can be improved in the future. You can also share your views by post by writing to Development Plan Team, Planning and Property Development Department, Dublin City Council, Wood Key, Dublin 8. And a reminder that the public consultation period is open until 4.30 p.m. on February 22nd, 2021. Now, the format for today's webinar it will be very interactive. We'll be hearing two short presentations on this key theme, and then we'll be hosting a live Q&A session where our panel of experts will be here to answer your questions on what's being discussed. Joining us on the panel this morning is Edel Kelly, Senior Transport Officer at Dublin City Council, Brendan O'Brien, Head of Technical Services, Environment and Transportation Department at Dublin City Council, and John O'Hara, City Planning Officer and Head of Land Use Policy with Dublin City Council. Now, throughout the presentations, please feel free to get involved. You'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there is a Q&A facility where during the webinar you can ask questions on the new Dublin City Development Plan. And once the two presentations are complete, the panel will be live to answer your questions and they will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible here this morning. We'll now begin with our first presentation. May I introduce Edel Kelly, Senior Transport Officer with Dublin City Council. Hello everybody, my name is Edel Kelly and I'm Head of Transportation Planning at Dublin City Council. I've been working in transportation in the city for 21 years and this is the fourth development plan that I've been involved in making. I've been asked to give you a really high level overview of sustainable movement and transport, looking forward as far as 2028, which covers the lifetime of the plan. So in the simplest of terms, sustainable movement is all about using public transport, walking, cycling and low carbon solutions. And the reason that we need to be sustainable in how we move is really because of the substantial impact that transport has on the environment. It accounts for 20% of all CO2 emissions and it's the greatest contributor to noise and air pollution. So moving to more sustainable travel means that we'll have a cleaner environment, but we'll also have a healthier and more active population. And the other important reason that we need to move to sustainable transport is because it makes the best use of limited space. I mean, let's face it, the private car takes up quite a lot of space, but it doesn't move a lot of people. So in terms of the development plan and the policy approach in the development plan, well, obviously the policies align with national and regional policy, and some of the strategic policies have been in place for the last couple of decades. So at a strategic level, 
its policy to integrate land use and transportation, which means putting the right development in the right place, high density development along public transport corridors and in the most accessible locations. Its policy to consolidate and intensify the city. And it's also policy to shift from private car use to public transport and active travel. The development plan will include policies to provide for infrastructure that Dublin City Council will provide, but also to support the provision of infrastructure by other agencies, such as the National Transport Authority. But the policies in the, in the development plan are not always um, strategic. There are quite a lot of policies, objectives and standards that help us or enable us to influence the design of private sites. In recent years, there's been a strong focus in the, in the development plan on high quality public realm and placemaking on embracing innovation and technology, and in proactively engaging with stakeholders to bring about behavioural change. In other words, to help people move to more sustainable travel. So how have we been doing, and in particular, how have we been doing since the current development plan was adopted in 2016? Well, the city is consolidating. We have more and more people living, working, visiting the city, well, at least in normal times. The public transport network has been expanded, the cycle network has been expanded, and we have major public transport projects that are progressing and that are currently out for public consultation. So we have Bus Connects, Metrolink, Dart Expansion, Lewis to Finglas. We also have major, ro major road and bridge schemes, and they are progressing. And these are really important because they're helping us to deliver housing. At a more local level, we've introduced 30 kilometer per hour speed limits, and these have been expanded throughout the city. We have car and cycle share schemes operating in the city, and these are also expanding. And I've included a photograph there of a go-car and the now TV uh, Dublin bikes. In recent times, we've also established public realm and placemaking as a corporate priority for Dublin City Council. And we have corporate structures in place to support that. In 2016, we adopted the Heart of the City Public Realm Master Plan for the City Core. And I've included an image there of the, the front page of that document. And I'll provide a link on the last slide. We're implementing that master plan and uh, we have achieved part eight planning permissions for key streets and key spaces in the city. And they will go on site either, uh, they're already on site or they're about to go on site this year. For example, Liffey Street, Temple Bar, Wolftone Square. Behind the scenes, we're also making a lot of progress. We proactively engage with communities and schools to bring about more sustainable travel. We have a project that dates back as far as 2010 in Drimna called Hike It, Bike It, Like It, Drimna. And this has been expanded uh, citywide since 2017. And I've inclu included that brand there. And this is a logo and brand that has come from children in primary schools in Drimna. And you can see the imagery there. You have a, a parent and child, which represents family and community. You have the bike, which represents active travel. And you have the heart, which represents uh, health, but also love of walking and cycling and love of your local community. And it's a really appropriate brand for our experience during COVID when more, when more people are getting out on foot and by bike to reconnect with their local areas. The model we have for collaborating and engaging with communities and schools is really to look and understand what the barriers are to sustainable transport. So we can then target the, um, our investment in those local infrastructure improvements. We work with green schools to implement recommendations from their walking and cycling audits. And you may have seen some of the images or some of the, the school zones that we've implemented during COVID. Another way that we measure progress is by actually measuring how people travel across the canals in the mornings. And um, what you see in front of you now is a graphic that summarizes the cordon count across the canals from November to, uh, 2019, so just before COVID. Um, and actually what it does show is quite positive progress in that 72% of people who are crossing the canals in the morning, whether that's to go to work or college, et cetera, they are doing so by sustainable modes. And only 28% are doing so by private car. So that means 54% are traveling by public transport, 6% by cycling or on bike, 12% um, are walking. Now, just to put a little bit uh, more context there, uh, the same number of people are actually walk, coming across the canal by bike as by Lewis, and twice the amount of people are coming across the canal on foot as by Lewis. So in terms of the next development plan, what are the, the challenges that the development plan needs to address? Well, I think COVID has shown us that we really need to accelerate the provision of infrastructure, particularly with regard to active travel, walking and cycling. We're going to have to continue to intensify and solidify the, the city, which means higher density development. And this means more people moving in the city, but it also means more servicing, 
And that puts a lot of pressure on the limited street space that we have. And a lot, there's a lot of competition for street space. In fact, this, the limited space is probably the biggest challenge that Dublin City Council has in relation to transport. Um, and because of that, we have to make quite difficult decisions around how we allocate that space. In the coming years, we're going to have major public transport infrastructure uh, that I've mentioned earlier uh, under construction. And that's going to present a huge challenge for the city because we have to keep the city functioning and, and, and moving. Um, I think with the delivery of projects like Metrolink and Bus Next, etc., we really start to think about what the future of the city centre should be and whether that should just be for public transport and active travel and servicing rather than the private car. And I think the experience in COVID has made us look at our urban villages and wonder what the future they should hold for those as well. Um, at a different level, we have to address challenges that have been arising in recent years around different types of living, car-free developments, different types of mobility, for example, micro-mobility like scooters. And we have to find the space and facilitate the expansion of shared mobility schemes. I've given you a very, very high level brief overview of how the city approaches sustainable movement and transport. And now really, it's just left for me to, to ask you to, to do engage in the process. And we really do want you to have your say on strategic questions around how do we encourage more people to walk and cycle? What is the future of the city centre? But we are really interested in hearing your views on things like shared mobility and uh, micro mobility. So from the point of view of shared mobility, are you prepared to give up owning a car uh, in favour of using, say, a neighbourhood car? I mentioned the fact that we have quite limited space in Dublin City Council and this presents its own challenges. One of the more recent challenges that's arising, particularly when we're doing our public realm schemes, is how we can permit cycling through areas that have a lot of pedestrians in them. So we'd be really interested in hearing what you have to say on that. We are promoting electric vehicles, but that again raises the question around where do we actually put the charging points? Do we put them on the street? Do we put them in hubs? We'd love to hear what you have to say on it. I'm going to finish there by just saying whether it's at a strategic level or whether it's to do with your street or your local neighbourhood, all of your views are welcome. So on this last slide, I've put a couple of links to the Public Ground Master Plan and a link to the Hike It Bike It uh, project, which you can look at if, uh, if you're interested. And it just, uh, it's up to me now just to say thank you for your attention. And I'm really happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Idel. Lots of great questions coming in throughout that presentation. Keep them coming in and we'll get to them shortly at the Q&A session. And just to remind you, if you would like to ask a question at any stage today, you can do so at the Q&A facility seen here on the right hand side of your screen. Now, our second and final speaker this morning is Brendan O'Brien, Head of Technical Services, Environment and Transportation at Dublin City Council. So thanks very much. This is um, looking at the development plan and looking at some um, different, I suppose, perspectives on the city. So if we uh, think about the city and uh, changes in the city and changes within the development plan, um, we encounter very often a lot of opposition to, to them. And I suppose just paraphrasing uh, Machiavelli and so on, it's really because people uh, haven't experienced uh, what change, what the actual experience of change is. So we have been doing quite a lot of trials uh, from College Green to a place like Grange Borman to St. William Street to to really kind of try and uh, get the concepts across to people in a real tangible way. And I suppose one of the um, one of the things that has happened really is that COVID itself has been a massive change, which has really kind of transformed the city in many unexpected ways. And particularly from a transportation point of view, uh, it really has uh, kind of upended a lot of thinking in transportation and presented us with some real challenges. So, you know, we, we know what's happened during, during the various different lockdowns, you know, the working from home, the fact that this will now be something to, to factor in. Our restrictions and movement meant that, that uh, the importance of public space in local areas became really critical. Uh, which hadn't maybe been there as much before. The reduced uh, traffic levels, really, um, what, what that meant was that, oddly enough, that speeds increased. And so we needed to have a more emphasis on safe space for walking and cycling. And it's 
it's truly kind of shocking that in 2020, the actual road fatalities in Ireland went up at a time of, of much reduced uh, traffic on the roads. So to a certain extent in the city, congestion kind of contributed to, to slower speeds. Once that congestion was removed, the temptation to drive a lot faster in places that were not suitable took over. So that's that's been a key emphasis for us. And our big one was mass transit. So our, our bus, Lewis, rail systems were all the main carriers of people into the city. They now have reduced capacity transit. And transportation policy for the last good number of years has, has, has all been about encouraging people to use public transport to walk and cycle. When public transport is no longer there, it's 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 at much reduced capacity. And during the, the kind of level five lockdowns at 25%, then moving to 50%, so we've had that reduced capacity transit, and then we've had, you know, the fact that people have uh, lost faith or lost trust in public transport. So how to rebuild that trust and get people back onto them? We also saw an unequal impact on the city centre. The north side was much busier than the south side. It's an interesting question as to why exactly that happened. So we have the viability of the city centre as a destination, um, but also much more emphasis on a city centre for those who live there. So when we introduced changes such, such as um, the cycle route outside the Four Courts and Inns Quay. We also made space for people to walk because what we've noticed during lockdown was that these areas in the city centre became places that people were taking their exercise. And if we look then at what this actually uh, means, um, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of what, what happened. So, Public transport, we, we would normally count coming across the canal cordons over three hours in the morning. We've done that since since really 1997. And last year in 2019, we had a strong showing of public transport. Public transport was really taking in almost 54% of people. This year, because of the 25% capacity, there was a much reduced amount came in, roughly around 32%. What we saw, car, um, car was reduced from what it was in 2019, but now it was taking in 50% of people, whereas previously it was taking in about 26%. We also saw walking was reduced, cycling was reduced. Um, and in total, and this, this would have been counted in November, which was kind of level five, but still with schools open and so on. So you would have expected to see quite a, quite a bit of activity in the city. So we had a roughly around a minus uh, 58%, 55% drop in the number of people coming into the city. However, the other thing was that the car numbers were the were the lowest um, that we've ever seen. So, so even though car was the dominant mode, it was actually only half of what it would have been, say, in 1997. And unlike some other cities in Europe, um, we're actually still seeing car use is reduced. So we have that 20, 30 percent reduction, whereas some cities uh, saw that after COVID lockdown and as they started to un unwind those restrictions, that car use actually increased more than was there previously. Footfall, we saw, we see again, uh, you know, in April, uh, 2020, March, April, we see the footfall dropping substantially. And this was all these different locations within the city center. It rose up again, you know, during December, during the time of the easing off of the restrictions and then fell quite sharply again. So I suppose if we think about Dublin pre-COVID, you, you know, one of the con congestion is, is really um, you know, lack of mobility choices. So co congestion arises because uh, too many people are trying to use the same space uh, at the same time. And as, as a result of that, they're they're basically impeding each other, I suppose, for want of a better word. They may be also impeding the public transport uh, use. And it's, and it's interesting that while, you know, the count that we did showed a large number of cars, they also showed that there was more Dublin bus buses coming across the canal cordon than previously. And that's for the same bus fleet. So what it meant was that buses were no longer being delayed by, by congestion. And as a result, they were making more journeys. So a, a lack of mobility choices can result in this congestion and pollution, which can really affect all aspects of society, environment, economic opportunities, and so on. So as we think about Dublin going forward and over the lifetime of this next development plan, we really need to target a sustainable city mobility for Dublin, where the mobility choices actually underpin you know, the society, the economic opportunities, the environment uh, and the health aspects. And that really means, you know, looking at what way we want to take where we are at the moment with, with COVID having changed so many different things, how we move that forward. 
So one of the things as we've been working through projects to, to implement temporary measures over the last while and trialing different things, we often hear, you know, wait until traffic returns to normal, then you have to remove things or we can only tell if this facility or this trial works when things go back to normal. And the question I suppose we really need to address is, is what is a normal, what, is there really a level of traffic that is normal and do we want to get back to it? And, and bear in mind, normal didn't work. So if we get back to where we were exactly pre-COVID, we get back to a uh, congested situation, we get back to, to you know, delays on bus services, overcrowding on those. And we also get back to, to, to difficulty in trying to make space and adequate provision for pedestrian cyclists uh, and providing pedestrian priority of traffic signals and so on. So one of the one of the big asks in the in the next development plan is is what do we need to have that would help us stay as now or reduce further, while also you know increasing mobility choices and helping people to work from home. And working from home is actually it, it brings its own challenges because you know we were doing one project where where you know people felt that we were diverting some traffic down the road, and they felt that that this was making their their lives uh, you know quite miserable. We did some traffic uh, counseling and we discovered that the traffic volumes on the road were actually 70% less than they were the last time we did a count, which would be about two or three years ago. Uh, and part of the reason that we <clears throat> conjectured really was that people working from home uh, are now more exposed to, to traffic noise during the whole day, whereas maybe before they were leaving, going to their office where they may not have noticed it. So this is one of the items that we need to also think about, the fact that people are working from home you know they're more they're more um, they're more con conscious of their environment around them. So I, I guess an overarching objective for us is to is in the new development plan we should work towards having a range mobility uh, options for everyone so that car use is optional and minimal. And and that means things like you know saying instead of saying well we need car parking for families we should say actually what we need to do is we need to provide the mobility choices so families don't actually need to to use a car or their car uses. Is, is is minimal you know so for example in new york you know new, new car registrations went increased by uh, 18 percent over pre-covid because they lost faith in the mass transit system and because a lot of people fled new york uh, to the hamptons and so on there was actually space on the curb side for people to buy cars and move, park them when people started returning to new york this has led to incredible difficulties in trying to find parking spaces um, and that's not really an area that we want to, to be to be going towards. So if we do if we do nothing different uh, now, if we do nothing different, if we, you know, not only could we not could we return to a previous normal, but in actual fact, we could do a lot worse uh, because if people still have have, you know, an inability or a lack of faith in, in mass transit and public transport. Um, then our car use could start to grow after many years of actually declining car use. So part of what we're looking at, delivery of an active mobility action plan, you know, looking at taking a lot of the works we've done over the last year and on COVID mobility, um, you know, such things as, as school zones, filter permeability, such as Grange Gorman and so on. And, you know, to, to work on those uh, so as to build a vision for walking and cycling developments in Dublin. And that's something that the, the new development plan should be informed by this process and also enable these type of initiatives. So again, it's how, how, do, how do we actually do that? To, in conclusion, really, what, what we're saying is, is, you know, we have to consider how not to return to normal or the normality that was there pre, pre-COVID. Um, working from home, there's different mobility issues. Is it working from home? Is it working from a hub? You know, the urban villages, the, the areas around the city centre now all need to be looked at to see if they got the links to, to schools, to, to, to work, to, to, or to mobility hubs, to shops, etc. So that we can actually, you know, prioritise walking and cycling in those areas rather than constantly seeing uh, the city centre as being the main attraction of traffic coming through. We also could sh has shown us really how unevenly distributed usable urban space is. And again, this kind of ties back into the use of, of, of streets. So if you use the streets is to, is to park cars in, that also causes difficulty in trying to put in safe, safe cycling provision, but also misses an opportunity to actually put in some usable urban space, whether that's you know, planters, whether it's seats, whether it's, it's other things to, to, to make it easier for people to live and to find their neighborhood a much more livable area. Shared mobility. 
we've talked about the fact that public transport is your is your main shared mobility, and at the moment people are reluctant to use that. So when we think about shared mobility, we want to start you know rolling out a whole series of urban mobility hubs where we have a range of different uh, services. So which which ones is is that the whole type of micro mobility? Is it the link to to car sharing? And you know public transport comes into that. So trying to to amalgamate all these ideas together um and you know really kind of allow people to to live in a in a much more sustainable fashion within their own neighborhoods within their own urban villages while still making the city center an attractive place for people to come to um so things like college green you know pedestrianization plans for those areas are all about providing people who live in the city with space but also making it an, an, an attractive destination so these are some of the different perspectives we now have you know, as we work through what's happened over over COVID, and really what we're hoping to do is to get some ideas for how the lessons that we've learned over the last period of time can be incorporated into the next development plan. Thank you very much, Brendan. And just a reminder that Brendan's presentation that you just saw there, Andy Dell's presentation, and indeed all of the public consultation webinars will be available to watch back again on the website dublincitydevelopmentplan.ie after today's webinar. And now it is time for the Q&A session. Uh, taking your questions are our presenters, Brendan O'Brien, who you've just heard, Idel Kelly, and John O'Hara, City Planning Officer and Head of Land Use Policy with Dublin City Council. Uh, lots of questions coming in, guys, which is great to see. Idel, if, if I could come to you first with a question that came in during your presentation. Uh, lots of questions coming in about accessibility in particular. Uh, one question here, how will Dublin City Council ensure that those with mobility issues, not necessarily wheelchair users, who need to use their private car to access the city are facilitated? Good morning, everybody. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, accessibility, I suppose, from, from that point of view, is, is about everybody being able to move. Um, I think although I raised the question during the presentation around what the future of the city is, um, it was that was more really around a spatial issue in terms of the competition for that space uh, as we move forward for public transport, walking, cycling, etc. So it's it, it, I'm raising the question as to whether or not, you know, we have the space from to, to keep up the same level of private cars, um, but not in any way suggesting that we're banning, you know, uh, cars from the city centre. Um, in terms of accessibility and having a whole range of people being able to live within the city. I think the issue of car parking comes up quite a lot um, because there's a lot of pressure from private developers um, and from our apartment uh, standards dating back to 2019 not to provide car parking for people living in the city centre. And that's actually quite a challenge because we want people of all ages, abilities and families to live in the city centre. So what we're doing is on every site that's being developed, we are effectively working with developers to work out an appropriate strategy for that site. And that will acknowledge that there are a certain amount of people who will need access to a car and keep um, using a car. Uh, but also that's supplemented by, by other modes of transport like shared mobility and micro mobility. So yes, we are very conscious of the fact that not everybody has the same level of mobility as other people and that there will there will always be a role for the car, but a much reduced role for the car. And as Brendan said in his presentation, it's more about providing, you know, a range of options for people so that they're not reliant on the car. OK, yeah, a lot of questions here, I suppose, from uh, maybe senior citizens who are saying that, uh, you know, for many senior citizens, the, the car is really the only practical mode of transport. Um, you know, so I suppose what considerations are being made for, for that ageing population in terms of transportation? Yeah, well, I think as well, I mean, when we think about accessibility, you know, our public transport services, you know, are designed to be accessible, you know, with our, our buses with lower floors and our castle curbs, etc. Um, so, so there is an option for people with accessibility issues to continue to use public transport. So it's important to say that we're designing our public realm as well from a universal design point of view. So when you are in the city, you should be able to move around easier. And um, like I said, I mean, when we're thinking of going forward in terms of our car parking, standards in the city one of the things that we are 
determined to do is to keep a level of car parking for people with accessibility issues. So we have quite restricted standards, for example, for workplaces in the city centre where we only allow maybe one in 40 employees to park. Um, going forward, we're thinking about removing the permitting car parking for the for in those office developments, except for having a level of accessible car parking. So it's definitely a consideration that we have uh, in mind. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody else would like to come in on that. Yeah, I suppose just to kind of uh, take up that point about accessibility and and uh, you know how people get into the city, how people move around the city. So so yes, I mean we we you know we're 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 not. Um, we're not blocking off uh, the city to, to people. We, we accept the fact there will be um, uh, a level of car use and a level of both both accessible use and deliveries, etc. But one of the things we are doing, and we've started uh, doing it over the last while, is is starting to put in, um, you know, disabled cycle parking, for example. Uh, trying to, with the cycle routes that we're doing, the the idea is that they are available for everybody, uh, from 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 young kids to to elderly people. Uh, the introduction really of e-bikes has has made the the. The, the whole cycle network really accessible to a lot of people um, and you know putting in those kind of uh, features also means that people can can be more active as well so part of the idea of having you know quite quite significant segregated safe and protected cycle routes throughout the city and particularly towards in the city center is to provide accessibility for for everyone um, so it's a combination again you know it's the public transport being accessible it's it's still allowing a, a you know, some private cars and disabled parking and so on in various different places. But it's also opening up uh, really the, the whole area of, of mobility as well to, to everyone is an important factor. Great stuff. Um, John, one here for you. Uh, do you think it will be possible to ban private cars from the city centre? <laughs> um, <clears throat> good morning. Um, uh, it will be possible to ban uh, uh, cars, but that is not the way we're we're intending to go. Uh, as we as uh, with the future of the city, as Brendan and Adele have said, there, the COVID cri uh, crisis has given us an opportunity to to rethink uh, the balance of modes between between walking, cycling, public transport, and car usage for uh, uh, for of uh, commercial wor uh, workplace and for for living in the city. The important thing for for from the city development point of view is to keep the city thriving, to keep the city um, a, a live, livable city. Um, so, to, so to that uh, extent, we have to get the right balance between car usage and, and, and the use by other modes of transport. Um, we must bear in mind uh, that transport accounts for 20% 20, 20 of our CO2 emissions in the city, and we have to contribute in some way to uh, re re the reduction of the, car the carbon footprint. Um, uh, as Brandon says, uh, there's um, only so much uh, space in the city between our buildings. We have to use that space uh, well, sensitively, um, and that in 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 involves a better public realm, um, a quieter public realm, but a, a public realm where more and more people can enjoy the city, live in the city. Um, again, Brandon mentioned there the um, the interesting stat that uh, there was a, a greater bounce back to the northern retail areas uh, for, uh, 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 after the first stage of COVID there. And I would uh, surmise that's because there there's more residential population within that catchment. Um, it's something we'd welcome views on, but our view is that uh, the increasing, uh, we have to increase the population of the city better density, better quality, supported by all modes of transport. Great stuff. Um, Brendan, question here for you. How does Dublin City Council decide on footpath upgrade works? Is there any report on the overall condition of footpaths across the city and upgrade repair strategy? Okay, so so in terms of that, that that's handled by our road maintenance department, and we we have a an asset management system with, um, you know, which allows them to to go out to inspect, do uh, regular inspections of the actual footpaths, uh, and to to look first of all at the the more urgent repairs, but then there is a whole program which which is uh, being funded uh, over the last number of years and continuing on, 
of upgrading the footpath. So, so really taking uh, the opportunity to to remake and to redo the footpaths. And it, it's an interesting one as well when we think about the number of uh, public transport projects which will be happening in the city from from bus connects to Metrolink and so on, uh, and also the cycle network upgrade projects. All of these give us a significant opportunity to also upgrade the, the pedestrian environment. Um, so good maintenance of, of footpaths is, is something that is a key priority for Dublin City Council. Um, you know, so road, road maintenance, as I say, do the regular surveys. They have a program of rolling out uh, footpath, both footpath repairs and footpath renewals. Um, and obviously, you know, that, um, you know, hopefully will be substantially funded in, in the future. Sinead, I might just add there, um, obviously my, my colleagues in, in road maintenance have a tight budget and a lot of work to do throughout the, the year. But um, just, to, just to flag the fact that when we engage with developers in terms of the development management process and the planning application process, we take that opportunity on every single site. And bearing in mind, you know, there could be th thousands of planning applications every year. We would engage with developers in terms of them upgrading that footpaths, etc., as part of their development works. So um, that's happening all over the city as well. And we set back, for example, building lines to widen footpaths, etc., as part of every development. Question here for Brendan: Are there any plans to introduce congestion charges for the city to reduce cars entering the city centre? Um. There aren't any plans to, to introduce congestion charge at the moment. Um, so I suppose that there's always been a number of different uh, discussions or, or views on congestion charging. So it's been applied um, quite successfully in places uh, like London, Singapore and so on. Um, and that's really setting up centre city zones and uh, restricting access to and, um, and uh, you know, charging a fee for people coming into it. Our, our, our kind of view on that was, was that that you know, in some ways, um, you know, almost, uh, you know, goes against the city centre or, you know, uh, kind of disadvantages the city centre. So what we would be more inclined to be looking at is is kind of distance based congestion charging, where if you were introduced congestion charging, it was about car use rather than about the specific area you're going into. So I, I think over the next period of time that with the number of public transport projects that we've got, the, the actual um, I suppose the amount of road space available will be reduced as, as some of those projects are rolled out. Um, but for the time being, we, we don't intend and we have no plans anyway to introduce congestion charging. OK, uh, question here for Edel. The 30 kilometre speed limit is welcome, yet ineffective without enforcement. <laughs> are passive measures being uh, are passive measures more effective, i.e. raised crossing points, elimination of sweep corners, etc.? Yeah, well, that particular project is, is Brendan, so he might want to uh, come in after this. But I think, yeah, there's there's an issue around speed and design. So, you know, where we have put uh, speed limits in, it may not be enough to have signage to say that this is the speed. It's, it's usually better to be able to design the physical environment and the public realm so that you're encouraging, um, you know, lower speeds. So, yeah, so I take that point. And DMORS, or the design manual for urban roads and streets, um, you know, talks a lot about that in terms of how you should be designing your streets. Um, so ideally, that's what you would do. Um, so in, in association, I suppose, with the signage and the law that says this is the speed limit, you know, there are some design considerations as part of that. But Brenda might be able to explain if, if it's intended to sort of maybe look at those uh, infrastructural elements. Yeah, so so I suppose with the 30 kph zone, so so what we've done uh, or what we're in the process of rolling out uh, at the moment is the residential areas. So so a lot of the residential areas have been traffic hammed over the years. They have ramps, they have uh, tighter corners, they have a, a mix of measures to to help reduce the the speeds. The the next phase of the rollout is is really looking at the arterial routes and and. Our arterial routes and main routes into the city go through a lot of what, what people would would argue are residential areas, urban villages, you know, Rat Mines, Ranelagh, Fibsborough, uh, and you know, with people living in quite close proximity to those roads. So it's the distinction between residential uh, roads, uh, you know, off those, and then the main uh, residential 
areas on main roads. So those particular ones to, to put in the 30 kph, which which we, we hope will have a, a more successful um, uh, public consultation and, and acceptance this, this year, uh, is, is more of a challenge. And I suppose it's more of a challenge as well to, to uh, change the guidance from the Department of Transport on 30 kph uh, zone. So that's, I think, something that we'd like uh, to be done. So. When you're th thinking though about putting 30 kphs on the main arterial roads, there has to be some uh, mechanisms other than just the signage. Um, so that may be, you know, reducing some of the space, uh, putting in, uh, you know, protected cycle routes will, will reduce the uh, amount of space available. Uh, we also use a, a combination of, of kind of, um, you, you know, uh, whether it's traffic signals, whether it's some ramps and so on. One of the problems you have, though, is that on the main arterial routes where you've got a lot of buses, ramps and buses aren't really the best uh, mix. So we do have uh, some solutions for that. But what we'd be looking for as, as we're going forward and as we go through, say, in particular, the Bus Connects project is to have the, the ability to, to really introduce speed, uh, speed cameras and speed um, better speed monitoring, better speed enforcement, particularly of 30 kbhs and particularly in the city. Um, so so that's a key objective of ours. Having said that, one of the issues or one of the items that, that putting in 30 kbh sends out a def definite signal that we want a different type of environment. And so it can be a process to, to, to go from making that objective and then starting to, to have that enforcement. But primarily it makes a statement about what we want to do in the city. So that's why it's so important that, that we do uh, seek to roll it out in a, on a more significant way on, on these routes. So that's something we're, we're engaging with this, this year. And, um, you know, we'll have a, another public consultation on 30 kph speed limits uh, this year, and we'll be doing workshops, etc., on, on that. So hopefully we can roll them out on a more significant uh, level on the interior routes this year. OK, uh, question here for Edel. How long after the introduction of legislation on e-scooters can we expect Dublin City Council to introduce a shared e-scooter scheme? Very good question. Um, Look, we've been waiting for the regulation on e-scooters for, for a while and um, the main concern being around the safety, the quality of the scooter that's used, you know, with speeds, uh, etc. Um, so I would think that there's a there's a strong appetite out there, both from operators and from the City Council to operate a safe e-scooter scheme as part of, you know, integrated solution to, to mobility. Um, so I would say that there are operators there ready to knock on the door um, to discuss with Dublin City Council as soon as the regulation's in. Now, having said that, we had a similar sort of situation with stationless bikes or dockless bikes back in early 2017 when there was an appetite to for operators to, to, to work or to land and operate schemes in Dublin City Council. Um, and because we have concerns around particular space and a lot of these stationless or dockless bikes involved, you know, people not necessarily parking bikes, but just leaving them up against walls, etc. We decided, um, well, I think I raised it, raised it as a concern with the chief executive, who then gave me the job of, of doing a report and researching it and making recommendations to him on it. Um, and, you know, the recommendation there was that we should go down the bylaws route, that we, um, the bylaws allow us to license operators. But I think the, the advantage of the bylaws process is that the draft bylaws, you know, we go out to public consultation, so we get the views of the citizens and we get the views of our local uh, representatives on such schemes so i think it would it took us i'd say about seven or eight months for the stationless bikes before we could actually be issued our first license so i that, that, i'm not saying that's the way we would go i think based on our experience of other similar schemes and um, it's likely to be a bylaw situation so um yeah, I think that that's something that we'll be ready to discuss internally in DCC as, as soon as the regulation's in place. Great. So, uh, so I think we could we can just add to that particular one that uh, you know we're now um, so you know we're now combining our various different uh, shared mobility uh, into one unit. So the station bikes, the stationless bikes, the car sharing, uh, you know, in into one um, into one section to to better manage these. Uh, and one of the tasks we, we have is, is looking to see how we can do a safe uh, e-scooter sharing um, 
scheme and we probably look to do a pilot initially but a lot depends on what comes out from the department of transport and the legislation we haven't seen any of the draft yet so uh whenever that does happen uh we, we'll have a look at it and see see what way it can be incorporated a uh, question here for john what are the plans in transportation with respect to a 15 minute city and perhaps john maybe explain what a 15 minute city is if, for, for those who might not know um, thank you. Well, a 15 minute city uh, approach um, has been imported, I think, from France and um, other cities. It's the idea, it's part of the mixed use philosophy or the proximity principle, where, whereby all of those uh, things that make good city living are close to where you, where you live, and live uh, uh, for example, where you work, where you go out for an evening, uh, go to school, um, and all those uh, social, social community support facilities. So our, our, our urban villages would be a, uh, would be a good uh, traditional example of, of, of a 15, 15 minute city. Um, so uh, going on from that, you can see how if we if we're careful in our de development plan, how we develop or how we approach the 15 minute city, it will contribute greatly towards uh, t towards the uh, uh, spread of mobility and a, a more uh, sustainable mobility system for the city. For instance, uh, right away, uh, more people will be able to walk to uh, 15 minutes to where, the, where, where all those facilities that I describe, um, cycling, then uh, e-scooters, and then public transport. Public transport will take you from uh, uh, most of our urban villages into the city centre in 15 minutes. So uh, you can see right away how with a bit of careful planning we can make the 15 minute city in, we can integrate that with our with our with our public transport thinking um over and above that and what hasn't been discussed yet um is the idea of our of our of our mass public transport uh, systems uh, the the uh, me uh, metro to the airport and beyond the new uh, improved dart lanes sorry dart lanes out to um Kildare Maynooth, those will make those uh, those areas within the metropolitan area more accessible to the city as well as well by good quality um, uh, mass transit public system. So we can, with a bit of careful thinking, we can make the whole uh, uh, tra uh, the whole city knit together better in a more sustainable way, transport and living wise. Thanks. Sinead, I might just come in there actually, just just to explain to people when when we have very very big sites come up for development, you know where you've got maybe a thousand fifteen hundred units, etc. One of the things that we do is we work very closely with the developer and their consultants to come up with an appropriate mobility strategy for that site, and we we will often get them to identify what services, what facilities, etc. Everything from shops to to medical to etc. We get them to identify what facilities are within five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute uh, cycling distances of all those sites. Um, and part of the strategy then will be creating permeability through that site to so, so you make the um, more direct routes to those facilities, etc for the existing community and uh, for the new community. And you'd actually be surprised, John, how much and how many facilities are actually within those, you know, that catchment of, you know, 15 minute walking yeah. spaces when you actually you look at the city. And these aren't necessarily just the urban villages. They tend to be, you know, maybe the inner suburbs, etc. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we're, we're a good bit there and people might not realise that already. Great yep, stuff. Thanks. Good, good to hear. Um, question here for Brendan. Are there plans for additional secure bike parking facilities in the city? Uh, yes, there are. Um, so um, I suppose at the moment we've been rolling out a combination of different bike parking. So we've we've rolled out uh, several thousand bike parking uh, stands all across the city to, to complement the rollout of particularly stationless bikes and the increase in cycling. We have a uh, facility at the moment in Drury Street, which is uh, one of our car parks, which which has a 300 space, uh, um, you know, secure uh, cycle parking. And uh, we're just finalising negotiations with another car park on the north side to put in safe uh, protected cycling into that car park. And we also have another one. So we hope in the next well, hopefully in the next month or two to be able to announce some some news on that. Um, so that's a, that that's a particular good one. And 
uh, I, I suppose what we're looking to do really is to is to try and roll out some more ones that are publicly accessible in in these kind of spaces. And I suppose maybe it's a reflection of the of the times we're in that we're in, we now have car park operators coming to us uh, to discuss these, uh, you know, converting some car spaces to cycle parking in the multi-storey car parks. Sinead, can I take advantage of that question just to ask for, for people to engage around that issue? Because yeah. obviously, you know, in, through the, the planning application process, we have sites that have maybe have 1,000, 1,500 cycle parking spaces in them, you know, and we're looking at things. At the moment, we started conditioning spaces for cargo bikes, and Brendan mentioned earlier on, and accessible cycle parking, etc. So we would be really interested in hearing both uh, in, input on standards in terms of, you know, the numbers of cycle parking that we should be providing. You know, do we need to, to change that in the development plan going forward? But we'd love to, to also understand, you know, more information about systems for very high density cycle parking, you know, uh, at basement level. But um, and also around, you know, cargo bikes and that that's the, the spatial requirements, etc. So, you know, we would be very grateful to hear input from people who, who might have a better understanding of those, both in terms of requirements and maybe what happens elsewhere in other cities. So, yeah. uh, Question here for John. Do you envisage a drop in population in the city as people move to more rural locations due to COVID-19 and more people are working from home? Um, no, I don't envisage uh, uh, th th that uh, at all. Um, what we're um, planning for at the mo moment is uh, taking into account the national planning framework and the regional strategy uh, uh, to provide for an extra 60 to 70,000 people in the city over and above the existing 550,000 over the next over the next seven or eight years. And that is not to take away from um, the balanced region development approach uh, for the for the for the for the for the rest of the country as well. But this this city, this capital city is the centre for uh, in, uh, inward investment in the state. Um, the population will be increasing naturally and, th uh, and through immigration to, to, the, to the city, and we have to take it to, to take advantage of that, or so we have to provide for that. Um, so um, I suppose uh, what in that way, what is good for Dublin for for making a more compact city in Dublin and for facilitating uh, and providing for the increased population is also good for the rest of the country and will not detract uh, for, from the growth poles in those other in other those other parts of the of the country as well, particularly the five other cities and their and their and their hinterland. Um, so, as I say, in 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 in, con in conclusion. Um, uh, all good quality modern, modern European cities um, uh, follow the principles of sustainable development, reducing the, the carbon footprint, reducing urban sprawl, and at the same time allowing for commensurate uh, uh, balanced regional development in our, other, in our other cities in the country. Great stuff. We've just got a couple more minutes left, so um, just time for a few more questions. Uh, question here for Edel. Are there any projects or research about smart city infrastructure with respect to transport? Well, yeah, like we've been working with our um, smart city and, and smart uplands for, for years in relation to um, to transport. And so some of those are around collection of data, etc. But, you know, there are some small projects that I've been involved in um, around technology, which I have uh, I think are, are actually as important. And um, we worked with uh, Enterprise Ireland and smart cities a few years ago to do small business innovation research, SBIR projects. And we went out to the public to ask people to uh, to address a challenge we didn't we didn't tell them what the solution was that we wanted we said for example a challenge is around you know cycling so um safety uh, maybe uh, shift to cycling etc and we had some very very interesting um projects around those and one of my uh, favorite ones if i do say was it was fluid edge um, Connor and Sheila if you're there hello uh, they came up with an auditing tool called liberty bell um, which they then expanded to be the Liberty Band, which um, 
allow children to effectively cycle and ring their bell, which then would collect data or walk and press the button when they're collecting data. And they were effectively auditing their own environment as they cycled or as they walked. And one of the lovely stories that they, they told us, and, and it, it's actually really important when you think about encouraging children to walk to school or to cycle to school, is that they really do experience the whole envelope of what they see. So kids were pressing buttons when they saw squirrels or they liked the flowers <laughs> or, you know, you know, so I, I, that's a really nice project. But yeah, there, are, there, there's a lot of there are a lot of things going on in that area. Um, and I don't know if, if Brendan wants to come in, but uh, in particular other projects. But that was just my little anecdotal story. <laughs> it's a lovely story, Brendan. Yeah. So, so I suppose on on smart cities, uh, we we have been involved for for a good few years on on um, several different projects, including. Uh, you know, things like uh, the HV permit checker came out of one of our smart cities collaborations with some other European cities. Um, and one of the things we're doing at the moment is that the whole area of connected and autonomous vehicles is obviously something that, uh, you know, has been flagged for, you know, as as being the great saviour. It's taken a lot longer for some of this technology to appear, but certainly as regards connected vehicles, um, we're working on a pilot uh, scheme with the TII uh, around our HV cordon and around the motorway. And we have to take, you know, the next, over the lifetime of the next development plan, we'll also have the EU ITS directive, which will actually require us to provide more information for um, car manufacturers in terms of digital mapping, uh, trusted services. So a lot of the innovations that are coming down the, down the road to us uh, can be put in place. So there are some of the things that, that, that were quite uh, involved with. Uh, at, a, at a lower kind of level, you know, we, we've, um, you know, COVID has allowed us to introduce a simple change, which is contactless push buttons. Uh, so people no longer have to press buttons to, to uh, add traffic signals and so on. So, so those kind of innovations are constantly kind of going, going uh, throughout the city. Okay, another question here for you, Brendan, uh, and I think we've literally only a couple of minutes left. So um, is there a plan to review residential areas in the city that are used as rat runs? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, you know, over the over the last number of years, um, you know, the issue of kind of residential areas versus rat runs and and closing off areas and so on ha has been a key topic with us. So we have done a number of what we call filtered permeability, where we allow walking and cycling through it. Uh, Walsh Road over in Drumcondra, Pigeon House Road uh, uh, over in Rings End, and Grange Gorman being the the latest examples of those. Uh, and there, where we're trying to encourage people to 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 walk and cycle to make it safer for say in Grange Gorman's case the, the various different schools in that area and the uh, TUD campus. So what what we've done previously I suppose is we've looked at uh, speed ramps, we've looked at band turns, various other things to reduce the amount of traffic uh, into residential areas or off main roads. I increasingly as we go through the next phase we we we'll be looking to to do that while prioritising, if you like, the walking and cycling. So quiet routes, safer routes to school, you know, put putting in place the, the infrastructure that, as John was talking about, the 50 minute uh, city uh, to allow people to walk in, uh, and cycle. And I suppose as part of our COVID mobility plan that we put out in, in May, one of the things we looked at was the urban villages, was the areas that people needed to, to get to. And so we started rolling out that kind of protection for, for cycle routes. Um, you know, some of the wider footpaths uh, and also, you know, to 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 really look at what the disincentives are, the um, the the obstacles to people to 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 use, uh, you know, to walk and cycle. So that's why walking and cycling will be a key feature in the next development plan. That's why we have a walking and cycling action plan, which we want to develop this year. Uh, it's really about looking at what stops people. It's not it's not taking a big stick and forcing everybody to walk and cycle. It's what stops people doing it at the moment. Uh, and we know ourselves that there are, there are many different um, there are many different reasons that people don't don't want to walk and cycle. But safety is is one of the main considerations. So residential areas, you know, excluding some of the the rat running traffic, making it a, a much easier and quieter way for people to walk and cycle. But connecting them up to 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 schools, to shops, and so on is, is one of the strategies we'll be um, we'll be uh, certainly keen to to progress over the next number of years. Okay, last question, and very briefly, Dell, because we are running out of time. Uh, someone asks here, how are you facilitating car-free development 
if the developer wishes to do so. Are you relaxing the development plan, local area plan requirements for car parking provision? So how are well, you facilitating? Yeah. Is, well, that, is that possible? Well, actually, Dunn City Council has always had maximum accessibility based car parking, which means you were always allowed to provide up to an amount rather than being required to provide a minimum amount. Uh, what we're actually doing is, yes, in some locations like in Bang, Bang On City Centre or really accessible locations, it's appropriate to have car free. But like I said earlier on, it depending on what the development is and if it's a residential development, you know, I feel that a certain level of car parking is required. Um, but that has to be, but we are, we're granting permissions for anything from 0.2 per unit up to maybe 0.6 per unit supplemented with all those other measures like shared mobility on site, ready to go uh, when when the houses or the, the apartments are occupied. So yes, we are facilitating, but it's a case by case appropriate right. approach. And again, uh, just to add to what Adele else in there, it's about behavioural change as well. Um, we'd like to get to the, the notion that rather than car parking, uh, it's car storage. Uh, you're storing your car uh, as 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 an occasional uh, uh, when you want it occasionally in, in your in your basement. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much uh, to everyone, to all of our speakers today, for you for watching and for your participation. That brings us to the end of the webinar and a reminder again, you have until February 22nd to make your submission and have your say on the future development of the city. You can do so online or by post. You can log on to dublincitydevelopmentplan.ie. You can read the strategic issues paper. You can watch back all of these public consultation webinars and you can make your submission there, or you can also have your say by post, by writing to the address seen here on screen. And it's very important that you get your submission in before the deadline of February 22nd. I leave you now with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, who once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Remember your city matters and your views matter. So don't be silent, make a submission and help shape the development of our capital city for future generations. Thank you so much for watching and take care.